right uh, to welcome to the last first talk of the last day of a very successful conference. Uh, so thanks to, to the organizers, to Ivan Remizov and his team for uh, arranging the second conference in this uh, in this sort of like series. And uh, my it's my pleasure to introduce the first talk by Evertian Hekelman and Fyodor Sukhovshev uh, from uh, University of uh, <coughs> New South Wales. Yeah, South Wales, New South Wales. Somehow I, I see the and I always think the north, and then it's actually <laughs> it confusing terms. So <laughs> in South Africa, everything is and is usually related to north. <laughs> okay, so the floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, and also thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting us um, to give this talk. So yes, it's a joint talk with Professor Fedor Sukhachev. Um, I don't think he's in the meeting at this point. Maybe he will join later, um, but we, we will have to see. So um, I will be the one delivering it. Um, so everything I will, I will mention in this talk, um, every proposition and theorem is based on uh, collaboration with uh, Nurula Asamov, Ed McDonald and Dmitry Zanin. Um, yeah, and Fedor Subichev, of course, and we're all from the University of New South Wales. So uh, let's jump right in. Okay, so I want to talk about um, the density of states in this talk, um, explain what it is. It's a concept from physics. And then um, secondly, um, explain a theorem we've developed that connects this density of states from physics to uh, non-commutative geometry, specifically a tool from non-commutative geometry called the Dixmier trace. And um, everything mentioned in this in this talk can be found in a preprint put on the archive just last week, I believe, um, by these same five authors. So Asimov, McDonald, Subchev, Zanin, uh, and myself. Um, all right, so let me first give a, a brief explanation of this density of states. Will be a little bit physics-y. Um, so, from a physicist's point of view, the density of states is a concept in solid-state physics that should describe for a material how many quantum mechanical states are admitted at each energy level, typically for electrons uh, uh, per unit volume of the material. So, um, let's break this down a little. Um, in mathematical physics, often these systems are considered that are, uh, 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 for example, when you take a crystal, you often take an infinitely large crystal, which means it's not actually well defined to see um, how many quantum mechanical states are admitted at a certain energy level, uh, which is physics words for what is the dimension of some eigenspace. Um, so the physicists do some kind of limiting procedure. They restrict the system to some ball uh, and take a uh, divide uh, the, how many states there are at, at energy level, which is well defined ball, divide by the volume of this ball and then take the limit to infinity. So it's some kind of limiting procedure. And they do this um, based only on the Schrodinger operator of the system, which kind of describes um, the quantum mechanics of this system. Um, all right, so that's the basics, and I now want to um, explain a little bit why this is interesting. Um, so let's recall a few basic facts from, from quantum mechanics, actually. Um, so these electrons, because typically you consider the density of states for electrons, these electrons, um, they have a certain Pauli exclusion principle, um, which means that any state can be occupied by one electron. Two electrons cannot occupy the same state. Right. Um, and the second fact is that uh, electrons like to occupy the lowest energy states per material for which we are thinking about the density of states. But we also know how many electrons are there uh, per unit volume of the material. And so physicists combine these facts into the following picture. It's a bit of a strange figure, I, I will have to admit this. 
And what we are looking at is the density of states um, for all kinds of different materials. So on the left we have metals, on the right insulators. I will focus only on these two examples and leave the ones in the middle for the solid state physicists. All right, so we went, when we look at the metal, what, we, what do we see here? So pictured here in the blobs, this indicates the density of states. Um, where the blob is thick, that means that there are lots of states available at this There's one specific energy level uh, indicated with a dotted line. And this means, well, it's the Fermi energy level. You can kind of think about it like at zero temperature, so at plus absolute zero. Um, the electrons would occupy every state up to this point, and above it, everything would be empty. But due to some temperature effects, there's a slight gradient going on. All right, so um, what can we what can we now say about this metal? Consider an electron at, at this region here. Um, because um, you see the states slightly above and below it, are, are there are vacant states. So this means that these electrons that are sitting here in, at these states, they are free to pick up a slight amount of energy or give off a slight amount of energy. So when I put a voltage across this material, the electrons are free to pick up a little bit of energy, give off a little bit of energy, and therefore this you can see from this picture that this material conducts electricity. When we now look at the insulator on the far right side, um, it's a, it's a diff it's um, the situation is very different because you can see that the electrons that are are, are completely thing, filling up one blob of the, of the density of states, and the next one is completely empty. But that means that there are no electrons that can pick up a slight amount of energy. They are effectively stuck. And this means that the material does not conduct electricity. The most important object of study, and it can you can tell you all kinds of things about the conductance of electricity of a material, but also on, on thermal conductivity and, and other kinds of, of stuff, like why gold is, is yellow or copper is red, for example. Um, so this is why the density of states is, is an object that is worthy of study. So let's now capture all of this in some rigorous mathematics. Okay, I will use a few conventions and notations in, in this presentation. Uh, maybe, yeah, we will we will focus on the density of states for discrete metric spaces. And anytime I will mention a discrete metric space, um, it is assumed to be countably infinite and such that every ball with, with finite radius has finitely many elements in it. All right, so what's a ball? Well, it's the set B uh, with center X naught, radius R. It's defined, well, just like you would expect it. This is all the points in your space X with a distance less than R to your fixed base point X naught. And uh, we denote the counting measure on X by these bars. Okay, um, right, so let's, let's just get on with the definition of the density of states, now mathematically rigorous. Okay, so let X, D be a discrete metric space, and let H be a self-adjoint, not necessarily bounded operator on L2 of X. Well, what does that mean? That's the square integrable function with the counting measure. But this is exactly why we use this kind of curly L. It, it suggests that it's kind of a sequence space, since we do use the counting measure. Okay, this operator is said to have a density of states with respect to a fixed base point x naught, if for all 
of the continuous functions that are compactly supported with F. The following limit exists. So we take the limit of our radius R to infinity. We divide by how many points are there in a ball with a base point x naught and radius R. And then we consider the following, the trace of F of H times M. Okay, so what is this? F of H is just the, the functional calculus uh, applied to our operator H. And then the second part, this is a multiplication operator uh, with respect to this function, chi. Uh, this is an indicator function. So it's the indicator function of the ball with center x naught and radius r. So we have a ball, an indicator function, and we turn that into a multiplication operator. Um, and this part is clearly trace class, so at least what's inside the trace is trace class. Uh, and uh, yeah, then if this limit exists for each function f, we say that the operator has a density of states. Why? Because of the next slide. Because if this limit indeed exists for all these functions that are compactly supported and continuous, then actually what this is. Um, it defines a positive linear functional on these continuous compactly supported functions. So we map a function f to this limit which was assumed to exist in the previous slide. Um, okay, so this is a positive linear functional. This is uh, quite an, a quick check. Um, and therefore, by the previous Markov representation theorem, this means that there must be a Borel measure uh, you know, u of h uh, on r, so it's a measure on r, such that um, each such limit with respect to a Borel measure, uh, this holds for all these continuous compactly supported functions. And this measure is what we call the density of states. Right, so a bit of a long definition, but does this agree with what the physicists think? Uh, I claim that it does, and to prove this, I wrote the following proposition with me. Uh, this is a proposition you can find in Barry Simon's Schrodinger semi-groups from 1982, um, and it states the following. So, um, if the following function exists, so we map any number e, E for energy, of course. Um, two, this is sometimes called the integrated density of states. It's just your measure uh, applied to this half ray. If this exists as a function, so if it's just finite for each E, um, and uh, if this is continuous at some, some specific energy level we know, then in fact, the measure of this half ray is equal to the following limit, which therefore exists. Uh, this is part of the proposition. Um, we divide by how many points are in this ball, uh, and then we take the trace of uh, not some function, but well, it's a function, not some continuous function, but the indicator function of this half ray applied to our operator H. And again, with the same multiplication operator. And I, th this is exactly the picture that it, I sketched um, in the beginning. So this is how physicists think about the density of states. Because this um, indicator function, when you apply it to H, uh, this uh, and take a trace that just counts the uh, dimensions of the eigenspaces corresponding to eigenvalues uh, in this half ray, so less than E naught. Um, and this multiplication operator restricts it to a ball, and we divide by the volume of the ball and take the limit. So this shows that indeed this density of states measure is exactly what the physicists are thinking about when they are talking about the density of states. Okay, nice. So we have put this density of states in some mathematical formalism. Um, however, there are some problems. Um, it turns out it is very hard to approve, to prove the existence of this density of states. Uh, and there are even many situations even where it just does not exist. Um, well, this 
of course, it makes life difficult. Uh, in fact, to make a slight connection to uh, this, uh, the title of this conference, the one parameter semigroups of operators, one way to prove the existence of the density of states is to actually consider these limits, um, but where you don't take a function that's compactly supported or continuous, you don't take these indicator functions, you actually take e to the power uh, t times h, which is a semigroup. And if that exists for all t, then the density of states exists as well. So, uh, where semigroups kind of, uh, where there's a slight connection with the semigroups. Okay, so this is still very difficult to, to prove the existence of. There, there are, of course, many situations in physics where, where this has been shown to, to, to exist. Um, but it's still a problem to make very general statements about the density of states. And this is um, where I will dive into some preliminaries for, um, for singular traces, um, which is needed to, to explain what our main theorem is about. Okay, so let's consider first weak Schotten classes. So um, let H be a separable complex Hilbert space. And for a bounded operator T, we can define the singular values of T, which is which we define as a sequence, as the eigenvalues of the absolute value of T ordered in decreasing manner. And of course, the absolute value of T, that's the square root of T star T, where T star is the adjoint, uh, just your usual absolute value. Um, Okay, so that has eigenvalues. These are necessarily positive. So this forms some positive sequence, and we take it in decreasing manner. That's the singular values. The weak Schotten class, Lp infinity, is then defined for p between 0 and infinity as a set of compact operators, t, so compact operators, uh, such that the, uh, the operator t obeys the following. So when you take the supremum of k plus 1, where k runs over the integers, to the power 1 over p, times the kth singular value, in order in decreasing manner, if this supremum is uh, small, is, is, is finite, is, then we say that t, the operator t is in the weak Schotten class. And in fact, this defines a quasi-norm uh, on your weak Schotten class. But in fact, it's not, it's not that important to know this precise definition. Uh, I guess the only important part is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, right? The uh, weak Schotten plus LP infinity, it's an ideal of compact operators in B of H, in, in bound operators in your Hilbert space. Um, but if you're curious and you know something uh, about Schotten classes, uh, these are called weak shuttle classes because there are uh, lots of continuous embeddings between uh, the weak shuttle classes and the usual shuttle classes. So recall shuttle classes LQ, like for Q equals one, this is the trace class operators. Um, and for Q equals two, these are the Hilbert Schmidt operators. There are also some inclusions the other way around. Um, for, uh, but well, I'll, I'll not go into too much detail, but there is a relation with the usual shuttle classes. Um, right, okay, so why why is this ideal important? Well, there's a very special type of traces that you can define on this ideal. So what is a trace? A, a linear functional phi on the well, uh, weak L1 space is called a trace if it satisfies the property that uh, phi applied to bt equals phi applied to tb, where you take t in your weak L1 space and b is a bounded operator. This condition is, of course, equivalent with requiring that um, uh, that, that this is unitarily invariant. So the phi of u star t u equals phi of t for all t in your um, ideal and unitary operators u. 
Okay, so there is a special type of traces that can be defined on L1 infinity. These are singular traces, which means um, the, the, the usual trace class operators, they are included in your weak L1 space. And these special traces, these singular traces, they vanish on the trace class operators. Um, all right, so for the definition, we need the definition of an extended limit. It's an element omega uh, of the continuous functionals on the bounded sequences. It's called an extended limit if, well, you guessed it, if it extends the usual limit function on convergent sequences. Of course, by the hahn banach theorem, you can extend this limit functional to a functional on the bounded sequences. But this is clearly, this is absolutely not unique. Okay, so there are many, many extended limits uh, which are different. Okay, sorry, so what can sorry. you... Oh, yeah? do you... Do you like to pronounce the name of Dixmier at that moment? Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, it's a Dixmier trace, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, exactly this. Right, yeah, so the Dixmier trace, um, it's defined by the following formula. Um, you take this operator T in the weak L1 space and you apply your uh, extended limit to the following sequence. You sum up the eigenvalues of T, where T, where sequence such that the absolute value of these eigenvalues is non-increasing. Okay, so you sum these up, divide by the logarithm of 2 plus n. Uh, the 2 is only there to make sure this is never uh, ill-defined. Uh, yeah, so that's a sequence, and you can apply the, the extended limit to it. Um, right, so originally, in the original definition from DCMA, it was required that omega is dilation invariant, and there were maybe even some other restrictions uh, originally on this omega to show that this indeed defines a trace, that it's this, like, from this formula, it's not even clear that it is a linear functional. Um, that it is linear is not at all obvious. Um, but in fact, you don't need any assumptions on omega. And this is shown in a very recent book, Singular Traces Volume 1. Uh, the, the, the book Singular Traces is, is out for a few years already, but um, like this year, I believe, uh, Volume 1, which is, you can see, is kind of the second edition of the book, um, was sent to the press. And theorem 6.1.3 shows that, in fact, you don't need the dilation invariance with this omega. All right. So these are singular traces on our L1 space, uh, weak L1 space. So and why are these relevant? Uh, it's because they are they play a very important role in non-commutative geometry. So in Con Alain Con's non-commutative geometry. The DXPA trace is interpreted as the non commutative integral. And um, the reason is for, for uh, because of lots of results like Kohn's trace formula on d dimensional Euclidean space, space which says that for with compact support, uh, you can actually recover the integral of f with respect to the normal of the back measure as the DXPA trace of this operator, where delta is the Laplacian on your d-dimensional Euclidean space. The C of d, it's just some constant depending on d. Uh, and in fact, Alain Cole likes to say that these weak LP spaces are, in some sense, the infinitesimals, and uh, that the DXPA trace is uh, that, that any at all can be written as the main trace so we have to find the right, <laughs> right operators to do it and uh, in this sense the main theorem I will show you on the next slide it's, it fits in this uh, philosophy that you can write any integral as a DCMA trace uh, so the, the theorem I will show you it shows that the DCMA trace also recovers integration with respect to the density of states measure uh, in, in a similar manner. All 
All right, so this is the theorem. Let's go through it step by step. So uh, let x, dx be a discrete metric space. So this is countably infinite and every ball is finitely many elements. Uh, and let's suppose it has property C. I will show you property C in much detail, uh, two slides in. Um, so let's just uh, take it for what it is for now. So it's just some discrete metric space with a certain property. And pick some base point, x naught. Then we claim that for any positive, radially strictly decreasing function w, uh, by which we mean it's that's uh, radially symmetric uh, with respect to this base point x node. So w really only depends on the distance of your point x to x node. Um, it must be, this function w must be such that the multiplication operator is in the weak L1 space, with our Hilbert space being the square integral functions of x. Um, and then we claim that for every deep space trace, trace omega, the following relation holds. So on the left side, we have a dictionary trace of T times MW, which is well defined because MW is in our weak L1 space, which is an ideal. Uh, and T is assumed to be a bounded linear operator. So the left hand side, left -hand side is well defined. And it, we say it equals the right hand side if the following limit exists. Namely, we take the limit of the trace T times this multiplication operator and divide by how many points are there in the ball with center x naught radius r. Okay, so what uh, what has, does this have to do with tensive states? Well, in particular, if h is an operator, a bound operator on L2 of x with a density of states measure that exists, mu of h, and uh, you just fill in t equals f of h in the above formula. Well, on the left-hand side, you clearly get this degenerate phase. And on the right-hand side, you see that this limit, when we fill in t equals f of h, that's exactly how we define our density of states uh, a few slides back. Right? It's here on the bottom. That's exactly our definition of the density of states. Um, so, in fact, we can integrate functions with respect to the density of states measure, uh, and you look at the, the DC matrix, in fact. Okay, so there was also something about this function W. We assumed uh, that this multiplication operator, MW, uh, should be an element of this weak L1 space. And thankfully, in the preprint, is also the following proposition. So for any uh, discrete, this should be discrete metric space, x dx, the following function uh, satisfies the requirements. So it's positive, is radially strictly decreasing, and the multiplication operator is in weak L1. And uh, yeah, the function is just when you take some function of some, some point x in x, um, the function applied to x is just uh, one divided by one plus how many points are there in the ball with center x naught and radius exactly the distance between x and x naught. So this function always does the job, but if you're in a situation where you can pick another function, that's allowed too, and the, the theorem goes through anyway. Um, all right. Uh, then let's cover property C. So we assume uh, the, 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 that X has property C. Okay, so let X again be a discrete metric space and pixel base point. Then the image of the following map, so we take just the, the metric of the, 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 well, any point you want to plug in uh, with respect to uh, your base point x naught. So just the distance of x to x naught when you consider that as a function of x. That is necessarily a collection of isolated points because x is a discrete metric space and we assume that any ball uh, only has finitely many points in it. So there can not in the image of this map. Okay, so the image of this map can be ordered in an increasing way and denote this by RK. So this is really all the possible distances uh, from 
like so, that there are, are points in your space. Uh, then property C states that this limit should be equal to one. So we take the points, how many points are there in the ball with our radius RK plus one, and we divide it by how many points are there in the ball with radius RK. Okay, so it may seem a little artificial, this, this condition. Um, and in fact, it's a bit maybe even hard to see what it even says. So let's do that. Let's handle that first. What does it even mean? Well, you can see it, you can see it as a kind of condition on the growth rate of these balls. Uh, and we did some digging, and we actually found a paper by the great Little Wood. Um, he proved a theorem on, on some Tauberi. It was a some Tauberian theorem. Um, and he needed uh, a series of real numbers, lambda n, such that exactly this ratio converges to one, uh, just like, like our balls have to do. And he had the following to say, this condition is satisfied when lambda n is any function of less order than e to the power epsilon n for all values of epsilon, which increases in a regular manner. When, however, lambda n is greater than e to the power epsilon n, the theorem breaks down altogether. So what does he say? When lambda n grows exponentially, uh, this condition fails. It just simply fails. So our property C, it just it excludes all spaces with exponential growth. But when you have some space uh, where these balls grow sub-exponentially and in a regular manner, then this limit effect equals one. Now it's a little bit vague. I, I will admit this. Sub exponential plus regular growth. It, it's it's a bit wish washy. Um, but it's in fact very hard to pin down what exact uh, conditions are sufficient uh, for this limit to exist. Um, so there are, in fact, there are, you can come up with many examples of spaces that have even maybe uh, poly polynomial growth on your balls, but they, they in such an erratic manner that this limit does not converge to one. So it's really something stronger than sub exponential growth. Um, but we do claim it's not an unnatural condition. So many, many examples that are covered in the mathematical physics literature, uh, with, where density of states are, are considered on some discrete space, then these discrete spaces often actually satisfy property C. And we give some examples in the, in our preprint. Um, I guess for physicists, the most important ones are crystals and quasi-crystals. Uh, but seeing as this is a mathematics conference, I was thinking you might not be very interested in these uh, very physics-based crystal discrete spaces. So I just picked the integer lattice uh, as an example. Uh, and in fact, much of the mathematical research uh, on crystals, or mathematical physics research, I should say, um, with respect to the density of states, is actually focused on studying the integer lattice. The, when you take a more general discrete metric space that corresponds to some crystal, it's already very hard to show the existence of a density of states. So the integer lattice is kind of your basic crystal example as well. Okay, so we take our, our ZD uh, with just your normal P norm. I guess you're all famili familiar with this. And the props is um, that uh, the amount of, of points that are in a ball with radius R in this uh, integer lattice with p norm is some constant c times r to the power d plus lower order terms. And this constant you can actually uh, calculate or, or pin down. It's the volume of the unit ball in Euclidean space with the same p norm. Um, all right, and that's enough to to show that this. Uh, that this ratio converges to one. Okay, so at least our theorem holds for the integer lattice. Now I want to show you um, a more intricate uh, metric space as well, for which 
property C is also satisfied. And this is uh, percolation. This has to do with percolation. Uh, I will explain bold percolation here. So fix some chance P between 0 and 1. And then decide independently for each edge in your integer lattice. Ah, okay, this should be, uh, we're taking a, a graph now. So we're taking our integer lattice and we can make two points if they only differ in one of their components. So just uh, kind of what you would expect, really. Um, okay, so we take that graph um, and independently for each edge, we decide with chance P if the is always closed with chance one minus P. And I have uh, included a picture here for what the result might look like. Uh, so uh, this is on set two, and only the open edges are, are pictured here, and the closed edges are just deleted. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like when you do bond percolation. And I should say that this model, this, this, this concept is used for, for well, various different things um, in, in physics, but also in chemistry. And uh, but like, uh, also for like when you have an alloy of some, like two different types of materials, uh, one conducts electricity and one doesn't. Then and, and if you mix it together, you also get some kind of random uh, mixture of things that do conduct electricity and things that don't. So you can consider this uh, this metric space as uh, some some model for that. And I should say, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, yeah? about about this picture, should we imagine Schrödinger operator living on this graph and calculate? Yes, you you, you can. Yes. Um, you can, uh, in fact, yes, and there are people who, who do this thing, it, or, although it's uh, very hard, I think, because it's, it's a very random um, problem. Um, but basically, but yes. is, this is what you mean. In yes, fact, yes. Basically, this is a starting point. Take yes, shooting yeah. your operator on this graph, which is yes. a random graph, but nevertheless, it is a graph, and then to, to, to study spectral properties of the Schrodinger operator. Yes, and typically they take uh, th like the difference, yeah, just the Laplacian with uh, like the differences. Uh, and, um, okay, right. That's Laplacian. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, right, okay. Uh, so I, I will have to, uh, one more thing to say about this percolation. So um, a property of this percolation is that there's a kind of phase transition going on. Um, so specifically, when, when we restrict to the integer lattice with Z, Zd, there is some critical chance Pc. It's dependent on the dimension d, such that if your P is greater than Pc of d, there exists almost surely one unique infinite cluster of vertices connected with open edges. Uh, when P is smaller than Pc of d, um, almost surely all, all clusters uh, are finite. So when I go to, back to this picture, this is um, bond percolation done with uh, a chance that is slightly greater than the critical chance. Um, and when you, when you stare at this picture for a very long time, you can actually see that there is one huge cluster that is actually spreading all across the picture. So you can walk along this cluster from the top to the bottom and from the left to the right. So it permeates the, the entire picture. Um, so, uh, all right, if we now consider this bond percolation uh, with a uh, supercritical percolation chance, so P greater than this critical chance, then there exists almost surely one unique infinite cluster. Uh, and we can consider this cluster as our metric space. So we can restrict to this infinite cluster and take the shortest path metric on X. And then, in fact, it turns out that this, uh, this infinite cluster is indeed a random subgraph of, of SD. 
uh, Zeti. Uh, this has property C. So this has this growth condition on the bulbs. And it follows actually quite directly from um, a very recent advancement in percolation theory by Seth and Theret. These people are, are I believe, uh, just mathematicians focused on percolation theory. Um, and yeah, thankfully, their result quite directly proves that the, this unique infinite cluster has property C. All right. Um, so these were just two, two small examples of spaces that satisfy property C and where our main theorem applies. But what is what is the point? <laughs> I will I will give you uh, two last slides uh, to say a little bit about the possible applications of this main theorem on the density of states. So to say a little bit about what the point is of of uh, having such, a, such a, an expression for the density of states in, in terms of the Dix matrix. So I guess, first of all, I don't know if I emphasize this uh, enough. The density of states is very hard to show to exist. And the, the, the our main theorem, I can go back to it, the left-hand side is guaranteed to exist. So um, if you want to say some general things about uh, density of states, you might just say, just look at this expression, this Dix matrix, and then worry about the existence of the Dix matrix, uh, of the density of states later when you have. Uh, so in this sense, it kind of extends the definition of the density of states in a manner that is uh, less difficult to handle. And this, uh, I will show one, one quick application of this, which is also in the preprint. Um, and this shows the following. So the density of states, we defined it with respect to a base point, x0. Um, but this is actually not, not, not a good thing. Like you don't want your density of states to actually depend on this choice. And thankfully for crystals, the density of states is indeed not dependent on this choice. Um, and well, one of possible proof is the following. Uh, I will just restrict to the integer letters again. So if you have some point at, in the d-dimensional uh, integer lattice and denote the shifting operator by un uh, on, on your square integral functions on Z, just translation by n, and assume that h is the operator such that the density of states exists for both h and the shifted version of h then in fact their density of states are equal. So how, how would we go about doing this? Well, um, in our theorem, in our main theorem, uh, we have a function w. And in fact, it's it's not difficult to show that like this, this function w, if it's in the weak L1 space, then when you take the difference of your multiplication operator with respect to w minus this uh, multiplication operator, but shifted by n, that this difference is trace class. Um, and well, yeah, you, you can also write this, for example, as the multiplication operator with respect to the function w minus the shift w. This is trace class operator. It's quite a, quite a short, short proof. And then you're actually already done. Because by the main theorem of the stock, uh, you can write this integral with respect to the uh, density of states as this Dix matrix. Um, so, and the Dix matrix is unitarily invariant. So, let's just uh, put some u n stars and u n uh, on the sides. Uh, then you get this this first term. I added also u n and another u n star, which cancel. Uh, yeah, I also I may have skipped a little step. These um, UN stars, they can they can go out of the functional. The functional calculus is, is uh, it respects this unitary um, transformation as well. All right. So what we have on the first line is is, is uh, the first term is the same as what was on the first line. And then we just subtract something and add something. So this does nothing. Um, all right. And then see what do we have here? This operator is trace class. 
the trace class operators are also an ideal, so this whole thing is trace class. A TCPA trace vanishes on the trace class operator, so this whole thing disappears. And what we are left with is just the last term. And again, by our main theorem, you can write this as the integral uh, of f with respect to the, the uh, density of states of your shifted, uh, shifted Hamiltonian. All right, so I guess this this shows um, one direction you could take this this uh, this therapy. Uh, all right, yes, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice, very good. It's, uh, I mean, since people had questions during the talk, I hope that they will continue and ask you further right. questions. So the floor is open for discussion. Any questions? Uh, I would I would add simply a remark. Uh, okay. When you mentioned on the page uh, 21, uh, yes, this is your theory. Yes, it is a, a nice, from my point of view, observation of what in physics known uh, as a self averaging In fact, what you demonstrated that uh, due to this uh, translation, in fact, uh, it is also known in probability theory as a ergodic theorem, as you right. want. So right. this is kind of uh, ergodic kind of properties uh, uh, for these uh, random systems. In fact, difficulties comes from randomness. Uh, if you consider regular crystal, uh, I mean that uh, periodic crystal, then uh, there is no question at all. But uh, your main result is, in fact, to transform this self-averaging property into triviality of the, the uh, corrections, uh, which is trace class uh, uh, when you calculate uh, Dixmia trace. That's right. That's yeah. Yes, for sure. And um, yeah, thanks for this comment about ergodicity as well. Yes, um, there's a there's a very short uh, section in the appendix on some ergodic uh, approach. With this, um, we try to apply our main theorem to this uh, ergodic theory. And for sure, this is a very large, uh, there's a large, large literature on this ergodic uh, theory, this is for the density of states as well. So we should for sure look into uh, more applications for our main theorem in this ergodic theory. Yeah. What I mean is uh, that to be, let's say, in contact with what you declared at the beginning, I mean with the mathematical physics, it's good to mention that this is self-averaging property. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the comment. Yes. Thank you very much. Are there any further uh, questions, comments for this talk? Oh, I don't hear, see anybody. So, okay, thank you very much once again for the talk. And we have at this moment about 